All right. Well, <clears throat> welcome back, everyone. Um, I hope you had a good break. And I am delighted to um, introduce our last session for today. Um, this is a look at the costs of making public access to research data um, a reality, uh, which is something that now is increasingly um, a requirement for uh, various um, funders. We have a wonderful set of speakers, and um, I'm going to turn this over to um, Cynthia Hudson uh, Vitale from ARL, um, who has done just a wonderful job of uh, sort of pulling this whole thing together and organizing it, uh, and invite her to actually um, uh, introduce everybody and uh, take it away. All right. Thank you, Cliff. And thank you um, for inviting us here to uh, talk about our work on um, uh, institutional expenses for public access to research data. Um, so my name is Cynthia Hudson Vitale, as Cliff said, and I am the Director of Scholars and Scholarship within the Association of Research Libraries. Joining me today are Christy Keene, who is the Assistant Director of Post Award Support Services at the University of Chicago, Melissa Korf, who is the Director of Grants and Contracts with Harvard Medical School, Wendy Kozlowski, who is the Data Curation Specialist at Cornell University Library, Jim Luther, the Interim Research Compliance Officer at, Uni at Yale University, and Shauna Taylor, Project Manager uh, for the Realities of Academic Data Sharing Initiative with the Association of Research Libraries. And just to cover a quick overview of today's agenda, I'm going to quickly provide some background and context setting that will hopefully ground these presentations that each organization is going to speak on. Um, so. Uh, they will report out on each of their organization's current and collaborative work and initiatives, followed by a brief poll about audience, audience interests and needs for research data expensing information. And we will wrap up with a facilitated discussion. Hopefully we can fit all that in there in 60 minutes. Um, please feel free to pop your questions into the chat and we'll get to those at the end or follow up after the presentation. So um, to jumping right in, you know, public access to research data has existed in some form for quite a while now. This isn't obviously an exhaustive timeline, um, but more key dates that have had broad impacts throughout higher education. One of the most critical points was in 2003 when NIH released their data sharing policy for grants and awards that were greater than $500,000. This was followed in 2011 by NSF releasing a directorate-wide policy for the sharing of research data for all awards. In 2013, in what has become widely known as the Holdren Memo, um, OSTP asked all federal agencies with over 100 million in research and development expenditures to develop plans to support increased public access to results of funded research, inclusive of peer-reviewed manuscripts and articles and research data. And I will say as of a most recent GAO report, all 20 federal agencies subject to the memo are in compliance and even some below that, that kind of threshold that was initially um, set. On the horizon and after many years of public feedback and engagement, NIH's new data management or data sharing policy will go into effect in January of 2023. And I really, um, I strongly believe that this new policy is prompting a renewed interest and in costs of costs and expenses. So um, to address these policies and points of a compliance, many institutions have purchased or developed technology or built workflows and services. Uh, this obviously is drawn upon expertise distributed throughout the academic institution, including campus IT, university libraries, research offices, research computing, the individual faculty lab or office and elsewhere. Like other operations in academic institutions, distributing services allows stakeholders to bring their skills and abilities while also dispersing the labor of the research activities that go into making data publicly accessible. It is a fact, I feel, that the distributed nature of these services kind of complicates understanding the full expenses 
that factor into doing this though, right? Um, few if any institutions have investigated institution-wide expenses for these services, given these complexities, the distributed nature, along with the unique nature of research and its methods by discipline and subdiscipline. It gets complicated quick. Um, often described as an unfunded mandate or policy. You know, many of these uh, federal policies and even private, pol private funding agency policies do allow costs for implementing the policy as, allow as an allowed direct expense to funding. So in a recent little bit of research I completed with some colleagues, we found that 62% of private and federal funding agencies allow these expenses to be included as direct cost. What activities were actually allowed varied significantly among the data policies analyzed and were also fairly vague, many using terms such as documenting or preparing or curating um, to describe what was allowable. And of course, this was so vague that many of the sub activities that would be engaged in that or, or inclusive of that were not, didn't go into any of those terms. So, you know, the data curation network has identified over 50 activities that could be considered curation related. So it, it gets down into details quite quickly. I think the big takeaways from this kind of general analysis is that none of these funding agencies provided example costs or budgets, and none of the policies address covering expenses post-award. While most of the policies stated that research data need to be retained for three to 10 years post-grant closeout. So to kind of pull this all together, you know, funding agencies are requiring the sharing of research data, have been for almost two decades, which is wild. Um, researchers and faculty can include these grants and their costs or in their grant proposals, whether or not they can fit it into their grant proposals hasn't really been tracked because we don't have a lot of information or data on the costs. Um, institutions have stood up services and enhanced services to meet these new repositories. But again, we don't know the full costs, so faculty can't include them, and we can't collectively advocate for new funding models if that's what's needed as well. So needless to say, there's a lot of work to do here. And um, we have heard from NIH that they will be releasing additional FAQs and guidance on what researchers should be considering or thinking about with regards to costs for data management and sharing. And we will soon see through the presentations that follow that many higher ed organizations are looking critically at how to account for the institutional costs for public access to research data. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our first set of speakers, Christy Keene and Melissa Korf to give us an update on what the Federal Demonstration Partnership has underway. Thank you. Um, next slide, please, Cynthia. Um, so for those of you who may be wondering what even is the FTP, we figured we'd start with uh, the Cliff's Notes version of uh, what is the FTP. It's the Federal Demonstration Partnership, which I think originally began you know, several decades ago as the Florida Demonstration Partnership, um, where you know, far fewer than now, we're currently up to 217 institutional members, and that's the institutions themselves that are members as well as a variety of federal funding agency members who come together to work towards reducing the administrative burden associated with federally funded research. Next slide, please. Um, so the red language here at the bottom is sort of our, our tagline, researchers doing science, not administration. So um, the FDP mission is federal agencies, academic and nonprofit research institutions and research policy organizations working together to streamline the administration of federally sponsored research and foster collaboration to enhance the national research enterprise while maintaining high standards of stewardship and accountability. So um, it's in a space like this, we don't wanna sacrifice um, good data management practices to get this burden. We wanna maybe create consistency or make sure there are clear guidelines um, clear best practices uh, rather than uh, really trying to kind of compromise uh, data management. Um, so we want to maintain a high standard while trying to reduce burden. Next slide, please. Um, this gives you a little bit more of the, the type of folks 
that participate in FDP activities. Um, the federal agency participation is really critical uh, in pursuit of our mission. Um, and we have, uh, as I said, federal, federal agencies that are members, but also uh, many federal uh, employees from those agencies that are critical to moving our work forward. We also have uh, a, a wide variety of engaged faculty representatives. Each institutional member uh, is uh, assigning a faculty representative, rep representative that can help us make sure that our efforts are aligned with faculty goals and needs. And then we have uh, a diverse group of technical and administrative representatives that, that can bring those perspectives to our work as well. Next slide, please. So our adventures in FTP, uh, looking at some of these data management cost issues uh, has been going on for a little while as we tried to sort of um, figure out where we wanted to fit into uh, all of the groups that are, are working in this space right now. And we did what's called a thought exchange with, uh, first with our faculty representatives so that we could gauge what are the, the biggest areas of concern for our faculty, where are they most worried about being able to cover costs? Um, and uh, this is the, the, uh, the cloud from that thought exchange. You can see that requirements factors really heavily, really understanding the requirements, where are they gonna get the funding, budgets, um, are, are some major themes in some of their thoughts. And next slide, please. Uh, we asked them specifically if they could indicate their top three areas, their top areas of concern uh, over some of the phases of the data management life cycle. Um, and the, the top three, um, pretty much the, the largest was what are they going to do closeout and post closeout, um, in part because once you hit closeout, the grant funds go away. And so how will they support the costs of maintaining that, that data uh, for the longer term so that they can share or use it? Data security. So that comes with like considerations like HIPAA and protected health information or export controls or federal information security requirements. And then followed by that is data management plan monitoring and compliance. Um, so once that award, and, and that again, is that close out and close close out. So once an award has actually ended, what is enforcement going to look like and making sure that they're continuing to comply with their data management plan, even, even after the award has ended. Um, we also asked for what types of data sets were typically used by our faculty members. And the top three responses there were data that they acquired through their own activities, so, so data that the researcher generated themselves, uh, data that was institutionally provided, uh, so something maybe that they got from their library uh, or uh, a collaborator, and uh, third was data acquired through purchase, so perhaps a purchase of CMS data or uh, a commercially available data set. Next slide, please. Uh, so for those of you who might not be familiar with thought exchange, um, the way it works is it's a little bit like Facebook or thoughts uh, where, you know, you can go in and you can ask one sort of really broad question, like, what are you worried about in terms of covering data management and sharing costs? And uh, each respondent can share as many thoughts as they like, and then they can kind of upvote <laughs> uh, or downvote, as the case may be, uh, the thoughts that others have added. And some of the, the main themes that came out of our faculty thought exchange is, um, as, as Cynthia mentioned, that, that this feels like an unfunded mandate. They're worried about you know, where the funding is gonna come from this new requirement, as it, it doesn't seem like there's funding coming along with it. Um, the, a desire for uniform cross-agency requirements. Uh, so if every one of the federal funding agencies or every one of the, the research funding agencies has different requirements, it becomes really difficult and burdensome for them to comply. Um, who is going to pay? Where is the funding going to come from? Uh, and along with that, long-term funding for storage and curation. Uh, they really are hoping for clear guidance on how they might be able to budget for these costs. So to the extent that they can uh, ask for grant dollars. Uh, how exactly should they budget for those? What are allowable costs? Um, 
and, and that we are able to explicitly recognize activities associated with data management, like data collection, transformation, documentation as legitimate and appropriate allowable direct costs. Um, they're hoping for clear regulations and they're concerned about graduate students being required to do this uh, and not the PI. Um, anecdotally, at my own institution, we have lab data managers uh, for each lab. And it's often like the first graduate student or the last graduate student or postdoc who joined the lab gets sort of voluntold that they're the lab data manager. Um, and, and we want to sort of flip the script on that so that we're really putting resources into data management expertise. Um, and then uh, sort of lower down the line was, what are we gonna do about repositories? How are we gonna find them and sustain them? Uh, worried about the NIH deadline and worried about the culture change that's gonna come along with the policy. All right, I'll take it from here. Thank you. Um, so after the faculty thought exchange, we then um, asked our administrative members of FDP what their concerns were related to these, um, to this upcoming mandate. Um, as you can see through the word cloud, uh, that plus sign represents FNA. Um, so how are these costs going to be covered um, is our main concern from an administrative perspective. Um, so you can see here, a lot of these do center around the actual costs. Um, and you know the management of these um, of this data. Next slide. So from there, uh, we are putting we have put together a group within FTP to look at uh, all of these areas. Um, we have a a great group that is made up of data management experts, cost analysis experts, and we also have a federal representative from NIH. Um, so we will. Um, be meeting routinely and uh, hopefully get some guidance going forward um, ahead of January 2023. Next slide, please. So our, our initial issues that we're going to be working on are exploring cost models. What options do we have? Thinking about f and uh, it's clearly not F. So where will these, uh, where will this recovery come from? And Importantly, as already mentioned, is quantifying these costs. Um, these are highly distributed, so um, there isn't like a place to go and look up how much X costs for each per, or for each uh, data set. So, and again, as Melissa said, this is throughout the life cycle. It doesn't end when the award ends. Uh, these costs will continue after the grant funding has ended. So, uh, where will those costs be covered from that point? And then we will also be uh, working on guidance on drafting data sharing plans and budgeting for these costs at proposal stage. Um, this is part of the mandate that this has to be recognized at proposal, it's not after the fact. Um, so the expectation is that there will be data. So what is that plan? What does it look like at proposal? Uh, whether that is um, awarded or not. Um, so yeah, these, these are uh, really important things that we as administrators and faculty are very concerned about. We're very excited to have NIH on board as part of our working group. Um, it, it would not be possible without their perspective as well and to hear our concerns and those of our faculty. Thank you, next slide. Okay, so I'm up next. Um, I'm the project manager for the realities of academic data sharing initiative at the Association of Research Libraries. Uh, so the realities of academic, academic data sharing project or just RADS as we call it is funded by an NSF eager grant. So Cynthia, who we heard from in the beginning uh, today is the PI on the project and Wendy, who you'll meet a bit later in the presentation is a co-PI. Um, and we are about six months into the project. So next slide, please. Um, so why is the RADS initiative significant and why is it important at this time? So as you can already tell from the um, conversation today, um, it's quite timely, especially with the number of changes happening in, two, in next year, 2023. So, um, federal policies requiring public access to research data have increased the required infrastructure and costs to meet the federal mandates. 
So of particular significance to the RADS project is the shift in the research data landscape since the issue of the 2013 Holdren memo. So this memo, as Cynthia mentioned, uh, directed federal agencies with more than 100 million in annual conduct of research and development expenditures to develop a plan to support increased public access to the results of research funded by the federal government. So this uh, federal mandate transformed how institutions and researchers manage their research data. Uh, the RADS project investigates these changes by asking three questions. Um, where are researchers sharing their research data and what is the quality of their metadata? Um, how are researchers making decisions about why and how to share research data and what cost do they incur? And what is the cost of the institution to implement federally mandated public access to research data policies? So next slide, please. Um, so we are asking these research questions to institution administrators and researchers at six academic institutions. So Cornell, Duke, University of Michigan, University of Minnesota, Washington University in St. Louis and Virginia Tech. So next slide, please. Um, so project goals and objectives concerning costing questions have been divided into sort of two workflows, um, institutional infrastructure and researchers themselves. Um, and the researcher workflow kind of builds on the institutional infrastructure foundation, because as we know, our academic institutions support our researchers. Uh, so first, um, RADS researchers conducted um, within the project conducted a landscape analysis of existing costing frameworks. So these, the, the frameworks that um, we evaluated are the Coger a hard costing framework, which um, you will hear more about from Jim today. Um, the UK Data Service Data Management Tool and Costing Checklist, the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine Biomedical Data Cost Driver Framework, and there are several others, I'm not going to list them all here, but you get the idea, we kind of um, looked broadly at what was out there. Um, so several of these frameworks include activities or categories which define public access activities within the larger cost of data management. So each of these costing frameworks is useful in identifying activities and processes required for public access to research data, but as was already mentioned, none address the entire research life cycle. So RADS projects investigators recognize the need for a more comprehensive understanding of the processes and activities required to make research data publicly accessible in order to then determine their corresponding costs. Uh, next slide, please. So of particular value in parsing out what these activities are is the National Institute of Standards and Technology or NIST uh, research data framework, a preliminary framework core. So the NIST framework identifies the research data lifecycle stage, categories within each stage and over a hundred subcategories or activities that may be required to make research data publicly accessible. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so in addition, uh, research data fairness activities are integral into RADS exclusion and inclusion of what is required to make research data publicly accessible. So any activity that is deemed, um, deemed necessary to make data or metadata fair are included in our assessment. Um, considering these frameworks and activities, campus mappings of institutional infrastructure were conducted at each of our six academic institutions. RADS researchers understand these frameworks cannot capture all services and activities at each institution um, and departmental and organizational administrators will be surveyed to surface any activity gaps. Uh, next slide, please. So um, several more months into the project later this year, um, campus administrators will be sent a survey to first identify which activity or service they support at their institution, and to second, determine the costs associated with that activity. Uh, we will ask what services and infrastructure does your department or organization provide for this activity? Who is paying for the service? What is the designated labor cost to run these services or provide that infrastructure? And what is the cost of the service per usage, per hour, monthly, et cetera? And next slide, please. 
Um, so as I mentioned, we aren't just interested in the cost to the institutions, but the cost to the research, researchers as well. Um, funded researchers in five disciplines, uh, environmental science, material science, psychology, biomedical sciences, and physics at our six institutions will be surveyed and interviewed to identify what activities and processes they are using, what activities are missing from their workflow that we did not capture, and what costs they incur for each of these activities. Uh, next slide, please. So again, building on the um, survey that we will send to the um, institutional administrators, we will also ask researchers what are their direct and indirect costs? What are their ongoing costs after the end of the project life cycle? Um, and if they had identified any costs in their data management plan, and if so, how did their estimate um, change or not? And then finally, after we've collected all of this data, we will do an analysis by discipline um, and by institution, recognizing that um, different institutional sizes will have an effect on on what cost means and as individual case studies. So quickly in sum to wrap up, um, uh, none of the existing costing frameworks address the entire research life cycle. And I think you've heard that a few times today. Um, activities for what comprises public access to data should be clearly defined and costs for public access to data are best captured across project activities as one time or reoccurring direct or indirect and as labor or capital. So that's all I have for you now, and I'll um, turn it over to Jim. Thanks, Shauna. <clears throat> Thanks for this opportunity, I appreciate it. Um, before I jump right into these slides, Shauna has mentioned uh, this group, uh, APARD. Uh, APARD is um, a group um, that was started with AAU and APLU. Um, in 2016, and APARD stands for Accelerating uh, Public Access to Research Data. Um, it's probably worthwhile links that we can send out if you haven't seen it. Uh, it started in 2016. Uh, there was a number of informal groups that formalized quite a bit. And then in 2018, uh, NSF provided a funding grant, and a report was issued um, out of uh, a number of meetings with I think at one point there were 30 universities that met multiple times together and remotely. And then uh, there was some additional funding from NSF and from NIH, and there's still ongoing uh, wonderful work um, in this space. And so um, this group, COGR, the slide that you see in front of you, um, I was invited to APARD uh, because at the time I was the chair uh, of the board of this group, the Council on Government Relations. And I think when I went to the APARD meetings, I was the only non-librarian, non-IT, non-faculty, non-VPR person in attendance. Uh, my background is administration and compliance and costing. And I'll talk a bit about what I mean by that here shortly. Um, but but um, throughout the course of that, had some great discussion about uh, the cost uh, and who should fund this stuff. And that's a bit of what I'm gonna talk about here in, in about 10 slides. But very briefly, COGR, if you're not familiar with it, is a group of about 200 leading research universities. Um, COGR considers itself and functions as kind of the national leader in this space uh, with regard to advocacy around um, different um, regulatory issues. Um, and they um, spend a lot of time, as, as, uh, as underlined here, um, doing analyses, um, developing position papers, interacting with federal partners and so forth. And so um, they also work a great deal with, um, directly with the FTP, with AAU and APLU. Next slide. So not knowing whether people understand what we mean by costing, um, I'll, I'll briefly explain that. Um, I've been, uh, I was at Duke for 30 years. I've since left Duke and I'm uh, part-time at Yale and part-time uh, at FTP. And when we talk about costing, we talk about how uh, universities and research institutions are going to share the cost of research with the sponsor. Sometimes that's a direct charge if the sponsor pays for something directly, and lots of times it's an indirect cost, uh, also known as F&A or facilities and administration. But, but critical to that 
is this thing called the administrative cap. Um, uh, universities um, have a cap on its administrative cost of 26%. Uh, many universities are five or six or seven points over that cap because that cap was set at 26% in the early 90s. And what that means is, um, for example, uh, well, when I was at my former institution at Duke, we calculated that of the 900 or almost a billion dollars of research that Duke does, um, Duke University contributes about $125 million to support that research. Uh, that is in cost sharing, that is in unrecovered costs, uh, in the f and rate, and lots of different things. So as we look at an issue like data management uh, and data uh, uh, open access and public data access, um, the reason I've, I've written this slide that this is a quintessential costing issue is because it is something that greatly interests the people that are going to advise leadership um, um, and uh, as to how to fund these things. And the reason it's a big deal is because it's potentially a lot of money as you think through the life cycle of um, open access. And, and one of my future slides, I talk about that. As Christy alluded to, <clears throat> um, it could be a direct costing issue where the grant pays for something directly or an indirect or F&A issue. Um, the, the regulatory environment specifically is evolving. Um, although, um, as, as Cynthia pointed out, this has been a topic for m multiple decades. Um, uh, NIH in particular, although they uh, put the notices out on this new deadline um, um, a year or so ago, um, January 2023 is right around the corner and there's a lot that needs to be done to figure out how to execute and implement on this, but also how to fund it. Um, I won't go through all of these things because it gets a little technical, but that middle bullet about a complex internal control environment, what I mean by that is if, if, if this is all about making, if one aspect of, of public access is about making the data available so that individuals can get to it, at a university, that could be a network server that's funded directly on the grant as a direct charge. It could be funded by IT as part of the overall IT infrastructure. It could be um, per a purchase on a procurement card that the faculty member gets reimbursed, and that could be capital or, un or not capital. Or it could even be me purchasing uh, um, Amazon cloud uh, space on my own personal visa and, and getting reimbursed. So capturing those costs, understanding how they're going to be direct or indirect charged, are very complex things that institutions are wrestling with right now. And I won't go through the rest of those items, but suffice it to say, it makes it even more complex as you look at um, those indirect cost pools that I allude to are the library, DA is uh, Departmental Administration, GA is, is uh, General Administration, which is often where IT, for example, is funded operations and maintenance, equipment, and then your research base in general. All complex things as we look at this. Next slide. So before we get into the life cycle, what I wanted to um, take a minute, <coughs> um, Terry Wallenitz, who some of you might know, was on point for NIH and the implementation of um, NIH's um, new policy for data management sharing. She has since left and is working with um, OSTP but she presented at COGR in February of 2021. This presentation is out on COGR's website if you want to see the details of it. But, but I think the things that really uh, underlie us or, or reinforce to us the importance of this is not only why is open uh, access and public data access important, um, th that is clear, but, but um, Carrie was very effective at, at mentioning time and time again the, the vastness of the culture change that is NIH's goal um, for faculty and postdocs and graduate students in the management of data and the public access of data and, and, and data management plans and curation and everything that goes into that. And, and as uh, you all know, as well as uh, all the presenters know, culture change is hard, it's expensive, it's difficult, there's lots of aspects to it. So again, as we look at these costing issues, if we were implementing just one little element of this, the costing and the magnitude might be one thing, but when, when we're talking about a real culture change about how data becomes so
so critical and such an important part of the research um, and, and what NIH wants to do with that, it really makes it all the more uh, critical. Next slide, please. I'm not going to go through this next slide at all, but these are the four notices that we're talking about. They came out in October of 2020. They're effective in January 25th. They describe the overall program, and then they have a separate notice, as you can see on the highlights, of what is in the data management plan, what are the allowable costs, and we'll talk a little bit about that 21-015, because it's wonderful that NIH created a notice, um, but it's uh, at this point, it's but a nod to really what the details are that we really need to sort out, which is why, as Christy mentioned, there is, a, um, a, there is a, uh, an individual from uh, NIH who will actually be on uh, Christy and Melissa's committee. And then there's a discussion of a repository. So really good um, out of the gate, strong messaging on this, um, but, but still um, uh, a lot more work that needs to be done. Next slide. When I was working with, um, with APARDS, and I'm going to drill into each of these so you don't need to look too closely at this, um, one of the things that became very clear to someone who does not understand the details of what is meant by public data access or curation or any of those things was when we talked about costing things, um, oftentimes people were talking about different elements and really didn't know it. A carpenter saw everything as if it was a woodworking project and a plumber as if it was a, a water problem and so forth. And so um, in one of the meetings with the public access to research data, I created this chart and I'm going to drill into this in two slides. Uh, so next slide. Column A is all the activities and I just kind of cut that column into pieces. Um, this is probably um, somewhat infantile from the perspective of you all as professionals that manage this, but from a big picture perspective, what we wanted to be clear is that when we were talking about the cost of public data access, we weren't talking just about, um, about number nine, which is storage after the end of the grant. We were talking about data management plan uh, development, which is a cost that inc is incurred before the grant is even um, uh, is even awarded. And as some of you might know, the hit rate is probably around 25%. So that means, uh, generally speaking, three out of four times that a proposal is submitted, it's not funded. And so there is a cost there that is, generally speaking, never really reimbursed. Um, and then you can see, as far as that timing column there, some of these things happen during the life of the award, some of them happen post-award and so forth. So again, in the discussions with the public access group, the public access to research uh, people, we were talking through, okay, when we're talking about costing, really what element of this are we talking about? And then we were talking about who's gonna pay for it. Uh, next slide. And that's, um, again, the columns across uh, the top. Um, I just talked about column A, which is the life cycle element, elements. And then as you talk about who potentially could pay for this, you can see um, in, in the top green section, the sponsor could pay for this somehow directly. Um, now there's lots of issues related to this because there's, um, there's um, congressional appropriation language that requires that, um, that money awarded to a grant can generally only be funded uh, during the life of that award. It cannot be Incur it cannot be spent for a future cost. And so it's, it's, it's not easy for NIH to say, I'm gonna give you $500,000 for five years of work, and then I'm gonna give you another $300,000 so that you can retain that data after the end of the award for 10 years. Um, that is very, very difficult for them to do, not because they don't want to, but because the way money is appropriated through Congress, there's significant limitations. So there, there can be, uh, there's ways that the sponsors can pay for it. In the blue column, there's ways that the institution can pay for it. Some of those ways uh, institutions um, can recover it um, if it's part of the indirect cost rate. Um, if, for example, it's in a, a capped cost pool, uh, then the institution might incur $20 million a year. And if all of that is in the capped portion, there's no way for them to recover any of that whatsoever. Uh, and then the, the third big bucket is external repositories. 
Um, again, that is more about the storage cost during and after during the award and after the end of the award. But that is another way that the cost could be shared. And so this was all about a construct to determine, hey, what pieces are we talking about during the life cycle? And then when we talk about those elements, um, who are the, the potential payers from a costing perspective? Next slide. So now I wanted to just take, I think I just have two or three slides that are specifically about what COGR is doing. Um, I did briefly look at the list of institutions um, that generally are involved with this group. And I would imagine most of you um, have uh, individuals, um, most of you, most of your institutions are members of COGR, uh, and most of you have individuals that participate in these meetings, especially because it's much easier being online. But even when we were meeting in DC on a regular basis, I would imagine most of you had individuals that went. And so, um, as I mentioned, COGR has expertise in uh, addressing various issues. In this case, um, we've established a work group uh, that is um, that is going to develop the expertise, share with other associations, and by that we mean ARL, AAU, APLU, and so forth, um, and look at the, the issues specific to uh, NIH's uh, data management um, and sharing policy. Uh, and so truly this work group is really focused on readiness for January 2023, although there's broad issues of how addressing this problem is going to address, I'm sorry, this, how we address this objective um, will also support many of the other things that we do. Three big objectives that we're trying to do, deliverables. One is advocacy. So we're going to make sure that we understand what those four notices say, that institutions understand it, that they're as harmonized across institutes as much as possible if they can be. And so there'll be a discussion around advocacy from that space. There'll be um, deliverables related to education and resources for the COGR members so that we, so that we COGR can help the institutions be ready for January 2023. And then there'll be an explicitly a cost of compliance survey and report. Um, and, and COGR has done this around the impact of uh, COVID, for example, in impacting research universities. They've done this around the recent uh, research security and foreign influence over the past three years. And they're really adept at doing that analysis and understanding uh, what, what the, the cost of compliance survey and report is. And they'll be working with Cynthia so that there's no kind of duplication of effort, but hopefully some synergy as we work through that. Next slide. We have three primary um, objectives uh, or current work group priorities. Um, one is uh, a, a series of briefing sheets, um, which is basically um, to, to some degree, although NIH um, um, has been sounding this drumbeat in one form or fashion for a decade or more, um, as far as this specific issue about the data management and sharing, it came out in October 2020. And, and just to be blunt, there's been significant distraction between COVID, um, remote activities, the foreign influence and research security, and so many other things uh, that, that most of us are um, a little more than concerned that we are um, nine months out from a pretty significant go live um, in, uh, related to an issue that it is, as discussed before, we have some significant uh, culture implications as well as business process and technology and so forth. The one is about briefing sheets and we're creating a briefing sheet to help discuss um, what this issue is with leadership and institutions. Specifically, there is some institutional readiness assessments that are being conducted so that institutions can really understand kind of where they are. Uh, it's a little bit parallel to what um, um, Cynthia said earlier with uh, six or seven institutions involved in the NSF grant, uh, but it's, it's helping an institution understand um, the diversity of the, uh, of the implementation. Uh, and by diversity, I mean in disciplines, um, oftentimes um, campus uh, schools and departments are quite different than schools of medicine. School of medicine, even amongst themselves, are very diverse and complicated. 
because they have institutes and centers, some of which may largely have implemented this, if it's genome, genomic and genetic, others that, that really haven't, uh, and, and a very broad continuum. And then lastly, as I said before, we'll be doing some advocacy around the notices. Next slide. This is what the first briefing sheet looks like. Um, we will make sure that we uh, work with Cynthia to share this and share accordingly. This is a, a very early version of it, but it's a, a basically a three-page document that summarizes what is NIH, try, what have they tried to do in this space, and what are they trying to do effective January 2023. Next slide. So this is the slide that you saw earlier. The only thing that's different is the red line in the bottom. And I just kind of wanted to close with this. Um, um, all of us on the costing side um, and uh, on the regulatory side, and I'm sure Christy and Melissa deal with this all the time, we, we want to make sure that we help with reducing burden, managing the regulatory risk, helping from a compliance perspective, but, but we also want to stay out of the way of the business of running a university. And, and sometimes the costs and questions, um, if not handled adeptly, can create issues related that, that could impact internal operations of budget uh, and management decisions. And that's not at all what we're trying to do. We're, we're, we're often trying to insert ourselves in understanding how these incremental costs will be, um, uh, where the costs will exist, how much money they are, so that we can capture them and potentially charge them as direct or capture them as indirect. So I say that kind of as a closing point because it really is a critical kind of um, difficult uh, proposition that you're costing people uh, at your institutions are trying to do as they work with the IT individuals and the library individuals and the, the vice presidents of research and so forth. So I think that's my final slide. And Shauna, we, yep. I think I turn it back to you, Shauna. Yeah, so we are just gonna run a quick Mentimeter poll. If participants here don't mind, um, I'm sure most folks are familiar with Mentimeter by now. Um, if you could just grab your phone or um, your browser, put in the code on menti.com. Um, so we were going to have a kind of fulsome discussion around uh, the Mentimeter activities and questions, but we are running short on time. So Jim, if you don't mind, we'll just um, let everyone take the poll and then Wendy can step in and sort of facilitate the, the final um, discussion questions. Sounds good. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so yeah, so please get started um, and you can scan the QR code there or enter the code. And then we have four questions. However, um, question two lists about 19 activities. And these are just a sample of activities that um, we've included from our discussions here today um, surrounding cost. So if you could just kind of glance at those, I know it's a long list and we are running short on time. And then um, the question after that is just sort of centering like what are you most concerned about in terms of costing from that list? Again, not comprehensive, just to give us a quick um, marker on where your thoughts are at. So, um, Wendy, I guess I will turn it over to you now once we get our results from the Menti poll. Thanks, Shauna. And I think it'll be really useful as we go through this, and I'm currently showing the answers to the first questions. Um, uh, as a dis point of discussion to display the results. So thank you. This one may take a minute, just given how many there are.
I think we had about 27 people identify who they were. So we're getting near, I think, um, totals ish for this question. Is there anything that stood out to you, Wendy? So clearly there are some things that are rising the top, but I also am kind of excited to see that everything has at least one vote. Um, I think that as we've talked about, as you know, brought up by I think every one of the speakers today, this concept of what is actually involved in meeting data sharing requirements is um, huge. There's a lot of pieces to account for. And as we try to gather information in order to provide the services that our researchers and institutions need to be able to support this, that we actually are capturing the full range of activities that might be incurring those costs. So um, you know, the, the, one of the requirements of the NIH incoming plan is uh, requiring a, a data, share, they're referring to it as a data sharing plan instead of a data management plan, but um, one of much, much of the requirements are going to be similar in there. Um, and it looks like you know, those kind of support services might already be in place. I'd like to hear from people about whether these things that you are already doing are um, incurring costs and whether you're able to capture those costs um, in practice already. I believe there's one more question too. There we go. So um, this one, again, is standing out to me as we're seeing more people um, clicking on interested in understanding better um, the costs around uh, active or archiving data post closeout, as well as um, meeting um, and managing uh, data that have specific security issues. And I think that what we'll see um, is that neither of those things turned out to be um, uh, top on the list on the previous slide of activities that we already are feeling um, that we're uh, doing a good job at or are already providing in our institutions. Any last call or should I go on? There's one more kind of open text question. You know, Cynthia, given the time, um, I wonder if we should just um, cap go on to the discussion and, and leave a few minutes for, I'd like to also give the opportunity for people to ask questions if they have them. Maybe you could put up the prompts of the discussion questions um, instead of going to the, taking the time to do the fourth slide. Um, so at this point, I do welcome um, comments and feedback. Cynthia is going to throw up some questions that um, we had posed as a group that might initiate some discussions, but also please feel free to um, unmute yourself and speak up if you would like at this point. Or you can put the question in chat. We'll monitor there too.
as a librarian coming from um, the science side, one of the biggest challenges that I had in switching roles in my position was uh, learning vocabulary. And I think something that um, I'm really curious to hear people's experiences about is um, making sure that we're speaking a uh, common language amongst all the various different players. You know, Jim mentioned institutional versus sponsor versus the researchers themselves and whether or not as we try to gather information about costing, if we're understanding one another and um, referring to activities and describing them using the same kind of terms. And if people have thoughts or experiences or have uh, had issues with that in the past, I'd be really interested in hearing about that as well. Sorry, slides are going wild. My apologies. Wendy, I'm not sure if you can see the chat, but we have a plus one to common languages. Some researchers are doing data management, but not necessarily thinking about it in those terms. Yeah, I think that is really too, I think it true. I think that it'll be really interesting as we move through this process in these various groups and continue the conversations um, to find out what practices are already in place that people might be doing and not yet associating with the concept of data management or data sharing and which ones are going to be new that maybe we need to focus um, some con concerted efforts on around at our institution. Um, Cliff, would you like to, to speak or I can read your question too. There's a couple of um, questions. How are the rise of specialist active repositories changing the landscape? And when we speak of public access, does this simply mean access by the public or giving them some help in understanding and using it? Um, the second question prompts in my mind this idea of uh, working through this in an iterative manner. Um, I think that at a baseline, uh, if we're talking about compliance, um, we need to have the data up there as a first step, but then instigating something with something like active repositories and fulfilling the um, ability for people to actually use it is a logical um, next step and certainly required in order to, for it to have be worth the effort to put it up there in the first place. Um, Melissa, you have your hand raised. Yeah, and, and I think in the case of the NIH policy, at very least, um, it is definitely the latter. Um, one of the stated goals uh, is to maximize the investment in research by promoting secondary use of the data. Um, and I think that is especially the case when we're talking about data that was collected using human subjects. We want to really make sure that to the extent it is consistent with uh, that subject's privacy concerns, that we're maximizing the impact of the contribution that they've made to science. So I think it is absolutely to ensure that those data can be reused to further research. You know, as a data curator myself, I certainly have seen a lot of cases where people have shared data to meet for example, publishing requirements and not completely thought through um, what it takes to get someone else to understand that data. And um, I think that that education piece, it isn't just uh, an awareness of it being a requirement, but an education of what is required to meet it that is going to have some costs associated with it as well. I think we're getting close to time, but um, we, I think we could certainly fit in one more question if someone's got it.
Hearing none, uh, any, any final wrap up comments you wanna make? Um, I guess I would just thank you all for um, listening, for thinking about this with us. Uh, we look forward to future discussions. Um, I think that there's a great synergy between the efforts going on with the um, FDP and COGR and the ARL RADS effort. And um, I look forward to looking at all of this aggregated together to see how we together can all move forward with it. Well, I thank you all very much for a wonderful and very comprehensive uh, look at the current state of play. I hope that you'll keep us posted. I think things are going to get very interesting when the new NIH policy role actually takes effect, for example. Um, and there's plenty more to talk about here. Um, as a side note, I, I hope we can figure out some way to get those um, charts, the, the, the poll charts into the, um, into the recording or the slide deck or something, and we'll be in touch on that. So um, with that, let me thank all of the participants here and Cynthia for um, uh, really pulling this all together. Um, it's been great. And